have meaning to you is to be asleep. And you should, by this time, know some of the signs of being asleep. They're right in front of you. Look at that exit sign. That's how plain the signs of your spiritual, psychological, mental, emotional life sleep is. That's how obvious it is. But you never connect your state of sleep with what we're talking about here in this room. You don't notice your behavior when you come in here. You don't know that the way you walk into this room, the way you talk to other people, is a sign of how asleep you are. The most obvious, if it can be obvious, sign of being asleep is the fact that your life is wretched. Now look, look. I want to see the hands of those of you who have a wretched, miserable little existence. Raise your hand. Now, you are the people who are asleep. But that doesn't, still doesn't mean anything to you because you haven't had the urge to investigate so deeply into your own pain, into your own confusion, into your own violence, into your own jealousy. You have no urging to look into that for fear you'll find something that contradicts your hardened beliefs of how your life should be. You've had ideals and you don't know, you do have no realization of how your ideals, which is always tomorrow, one step out so that you can go over the first little circle you've drawn around you. Go beyond that first little circle and look back and look with astonishment and say to yourself, well, what do you know? I dared to step beyond that little circle and nothing bad happened to me. I dared to, instead of going into great weeping and crying in my insecurity of having lost something or not attained something, instead of going into an emotional, dramatic scene about it, I investigated why I cried. I investigated why I felt hateful. That is stepping outside the first little circle. Most people won't even do that take the first little step outside of the first little circle because they're afraid. Look, look, here's the individual standing with his eyes closed and all clutched within himself. And he says, if I step over even that first circle, I'm going to get hurt. Don't you have one ounce of brains in your whole system? What kind of a nonsensical stupid remark is that if I step out of the first circle I'm going to get hurt can't you see it I'm struggling here with work can't you see it no you can't you're already in hurt you're already looking for someone outside yourself to rescue you you're all always very, very alert to find fault with someone else, to attack something, to blame something. Can't you see the pain that you are actually in? If you could, if you could begin to do that much tonight, just see where you actually are inwardly instead of lying about it, which is all you know to do. See the horror of your life as it actually is, you would find that there is something that is not a part of your sickness that is that is just waiting to come to your rescue, but you won't let it because you insist on rescuing yourself with your own sickness. You insist on taking the bottle of poison and calling it medicine. Haven't you haven't you noticed the, the extreme nervous stubbornness, the bullheadedness in you, 
when someone tries to correct you over even the smallest thing, how you stiffen up, how you won't listen, how you always know better. How come you always know better than anyone or anything, including God himself? I'll tell you a story. A story of mankind, including us here. There was once a village, a large village of people, and they went about their business of trading and raising families and doing their daily business. And one day, one evening, we'll make it an evening. See, I'm making this up pretty much as I go along. And one evening, while they were at dinner, all these thousands of people in town, all of a sudden, when it was a little bit quiet toward the evening, there was the most marvelous, beautiful music they'd ever heard in their life coming from somewhere. Not the radio, not the TV, not the phonograph record. But somewhere, coming from somewhere, was a most beautiful melody they'd ever heard in their life. And whatever they were doing, whether they are reading or working in the garden, they paused and listen to this beautiful music unlike anything they'd ever heard before. It, they were paralyzed at the beauty of it. So the music faded out and they went about their business. Two or three days passed, the same thing happened again. The music came down from somewhere. They all paused to listen, fascinated by it. So finally a group of men got together and they decided to investigate the source of the music. So they looked around, searched around, couldn't find it, committee of a number of people. Couldn't find it first, so they determined to listen a little closer the next time it came and try to determine the direction in which it came. So they did. And then sure enough, it came another evening and hit this beautiful, astonishingly lovely music song. And they finally determined that it had come from a plateau outside of town somewhere. So they got together and a number of the men and walked up toward the plateau and had to cut through brush and walk upward side of the hill a little bit. And eventually they come it did indeed come upon a plateau and to their relief and delight and astonishment they Sure enough, there were some musicians there playing the melody, an even dozen musicians. And so they walked over, and the musicians stopped playing, and they, they said, what's going on here? We've been down in town hearing this beautiful music every night. What's this all about? Beautiful. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it, but it's very mysterious. Could you explain the situation to us? So the spokesman said, yes, we, uh, we are musicians, we're not composers. This music, this beautiful melody that you've heard repeated over and over, was given to us by a, a great composer. He's no longer with us, but he gave this music to us and he gave us instructions for passing it along to people down in the town there. He told us to come here in this glen, this grove, and play it every once in a while to see if people would be interested in knowing more about it, as you have done. So the men uh, from the village were very gratified at hearing the information. And so they went on down the village and told the other people about it. And gradually, over the weeks, the music kept coming down and down again. Everybody had now heard it and were fascinated by it. So the men from the village went up again and asked the musicians, uh, since it's so beautiful, could you come down to the village and give us concerts right down in our village? We have a marvelous auditorium down there. Thousands of people could come in here if you'll come down and play for it. And the spokesman of, for the musicians, the 12 musicians, 
said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. The composer of this beautiful melody gave us specific instructions as to how we were to give you the music, which is to stay right here in this simple, beautiful place and play it every once in a while for those of you who want to hear it. You can hear it any time you want. We'll continue to play. Well, at this point, the villagers who came up to ask uh, the men about it began to get a little bit annoyed. They didn't quite expect the what they called the lack of cooperation from the musicians. Besides, they, they saw their minds are now working in a little different way than intended by the musicians. So the villagers went back down the village and got some professional musicians in the town, said, come on up with us. I want you to do something. Uh, we want you specifically, without telling the 12 musicians on the plateau there, we want you to come up and listen very carefully, watch the instruments they're using, and memorize the melody. We'll get it for ourselves. They, they won't cooperate with us. They won't come down and give it to us. They insist on doing things their way, and we much prefer to do things our way. So the musicians went up with them and took notes. And however musicians learn how a melody is played. And so they took the piece, the song, melody, down to the village with them. And so they met in a big business building, all the villagers and the musicians, they all got together and they decided that uh, they had something pretty commercial here, a beautiful piece like that. Let's get together, let's organize into a committee to send this beautiful piece out into the world. We could sell sheet music, we could sell records on it, we could make a lot of money on it. Musicians remember now, this is our song, it now becomes ours because they refused to cooperate with us. They refused to come down where we invited them. We were very courteous, we invited them to town. They refused to come down here. So it's our song. So at this point, one of the musicians, musicians said, fine, great, let's do it. But we have to improve the song. You understand? It's not exactly perfect. It's not commercial enough. We have to make it more suitable for the masses, for example. It doesn't have a title. It's just kind of a song without a title. You get to announce it on the radio and have it at the top of your sheet music, things like that. So they began discussing a title for the song, and all of a sudden, uh, as they went on about it, they fell into dispute. I want this title, no, I want that title. And so they had a big fight, and they divided into two or three groups. And already now the villagers and the musicians were divided into two or three different hostile groups. A little later they said, well, what's a song without words? Let's add our own words to it. Let's give it real meaning. As it is, it doesn't have real meaning at all. So they put their own words to it. And then they decided, one of the musicians said, you know, I've been studying this song, and there's one note that isn't quite right. Let's substitute B flat for E sharp, whatever music is. So they agreed, okay, if you think you can prove it, change one note. Another musician said, yeah, that's, that's right, but there's another note you didn't catch. Let's change that note. Third note was changed, fourth note was changed. You're following me, aren't you? Twelve musicians. <laughs> so they had decided to have a grand concert play the music. Would you believe it? It had a title. It had jazzy words to it to appeal to the masses. And if you could have heard that melody as it was played in the Grand Concert Hall with 20,000 noisy people there, you would not have recognized it as the same tune that had originally come down from the mountain, from the plateau. But that's the way it was. There is coming down from the sky a beautiful melody right now, and I'm looking at the clock right now at about 10 minutes after 7. It's right in this room at this very minute. 
And the only reason you don't hear it, don't hear its beauty, the only reason that you're not charmed by it is because you have cooperated and I have cooperated with all these noisy commercial people who have took the original truth and distorted it into something which can't be recognized by anything higher because we want to commercialize it according to our own personal desires. We want to live our life the way I want to live my life. And that is a pretty simple illustration, is it not, of why you have 5,000 religious groups in the world, why you have all these people each claiming to have the truth, <coughs> each one distorting it according to their own ego gratification and hating other, every other group that didn't go along with their particular distortion. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the way we are. As long as you are distorting the melody with your memories, with your choices, with your smugness, with your arrogance, with your beliefs, how do you expect to ever have any other kind of a life, a life that could be a life of a good deal of right pleasure under the right kind of influence of the beautiful music coming down from above? And you, you should know by this time that there is not an ounce of sentimentality in a single word that I've given you so far tonight. These are the facts. And if you can begin to recognize them, begin to study them, begin to have a, just a little bit of courage to know that all these jazzy songs that society is singing and that you are singing yourself because you were taught them. The song that you have to be a success, that you have to be someone, that you have to be accepted, that you have to be approved, that you have to please mama, that you have to please papa, that you have to be a good person and you don't even know what it means to be a good person. As long as you don't understand that all these are distortions that you have accepted as being right and true. As long as you don't understand that you're living from distortions, how are you going to begin to get rid of them? Now, I'm going to switch to another word, and please listen carefully. You won't understand it, as usual, because you understand so little. Think of the word imagination. Imagination is, is perhaps the single greatest blockage to you hearing what you could be hearing from the mountaintop. Imagination is so cunning, so forceful, so smooth, so, so powerful with quote marks and powerful because there's no power in itself. Imagination can parade around and make you think that you're on the right track, that if you just get that education, if you just get that man, you just get that woman, then everything will be okay. Then maybe I'll hear this music. You're not going to hear the music until you understand that you've been living from, living from acquired imagination all your life. You don't know the depths to which you've been captured by it. So you can begin to see how you'd rather go into daydreams about the conquests that you're going to make. Till you can see that you're simply living from a wrong part of your mind, a wrong function of your mind. And sacrifice that, as much pain as it puts you in, the sacrifice of imagination parading as reality causes a good deal of agony. You won't want to do it. You refuse to do it. Your refusal is so enormous you won't see it and you won't listen to what I'm telling you here tonight. 
Your imagination controls your whole life so overwhelmingly that you're not hearing what I'm telling you here tonight. You had better understand what it means to get very, very suspicious of how your own inner psychic state has deceived you. For example, again, you are all very, very scared human beings. Every one of you, from the youngest in the room to the oldest, you are just plain scared. And don't you see that when you are scared, that you're not, you can't possibly think intelligently toward life? How can fear, how can trembling, which is unintelligent, which is stupid, how can that fear think intelligently about your life? It can't, but you don't know this. Because the reaction of fear, of nervousness, of uncertainty, of doubt, overtakes you so instantaneously at the time of a challenge that you don't know you're being taken over. Not knowing that you're taking over, taken over in that minor or major crisis, you then go into something that pains you very badly, which is an imaginary solution. I met a man last Wednesday, and I was watching him behave in a certain situation. I was watching him. I had plenty of time to watch him, hours at a time to watch him. And he would go over and talk with another person in the room, and he'd crack jokes, and he'd make wise remarks, and he would be a very cheerfully, cheerful, friendly sort of man. <clears throat> and I was watching him so carefully that between his joking and his talking, I could see, I could see the, where he was beginning to slow down a little bit because he didn't have someone to talk to and so he wouldn't permit that. And so he immediately surrendered to the mechanical, unconscious, imaginary forces inside of himself. And he went ahead of it, it again. And no matter how nonsensical, sensical, how futile, how useless, how senseless his conversations was, he was a driven man, a compelled man, he had to go ahead and do all these things because he was afraid that if he saw through himself and just sat back and didn't talk, he was afraid. I could see this, and there's no way I could tell him, not in a million years. I could see that he would fear, he feared, actually feared, that if he slowed down and put his hands down, and stopped his talking and let his mind and his feelings and his actions slow down, I could see that he would be in terror of not existing. And all the imagination and all the lies that you and he had absorbed and taken as real and as necessary. All those lies were so powerful, so encompassing with yourself is killing you. I saw a man who was killing himself all day long by his behavior. Don't you know what you're doing to yourself? It is possible for you to stand apart and watch yourself slaughtering yourself all day long. Beyond that observation of it will come understanding of it. After a certain preliminary understanding will come a separation from it. There will be a certain detachment of this mad, violent, compulsive force that you see going on inside of you. Further than that 
will come the first faint dim realization that there is a part of you, an entity in you that can simply see the, the madness, the slaughter going on without being involved in it in any way at all. And when you reach this state, then you'll know for yourself what it means to hear the beautiful music directly and purely. Ah, you'll be one of the musicians. You'll know the music by heart. It'll be a part of your, your inner system. And it will be pure in its originality because it comes straight from the source of God himself, of truth itself. And there'll be no separation. There'll be no division between you and the music. You're the song itself. And you're the beauty itself. Then you won't ever, ever again hurt yourself. And you'll never, ever again hurt anyone else. We'll take a ten minute break. What do you think? <laughs> do you, yes. Huh? Yes. Are you a little suspicious of a ghost writer? <laughs> Notice that I left it unanswered. Don't you? Go ahead, Alicia. I thought that to be a jury duty, you have to vote. And I understood that you didn't vote. Well, I uh, property tax owner. Oh, tax. You know, county taxpayer. Well, we have that crisis out of the way. <laughs> now let's solve Chuck's crisis. Go ahead. This. <laughs> How did I do? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, you know, you know what you are, Sally. You're an old maid school teacher. You know, so prim. I mean, get up here and let us have it, you know? I'll tell you what, uh, we're very informal now. We have questions and answers if you want them. But the verdict in this case was guilty, and quite obviously. But afterward, the judge made a very good remark after he, the verdict was brought in and the jury was dismissed. Listen to this, very good. Now, he's a sleeping human being, of course, but he said, this is not a personal victory for you. Oh, you sit there, you don't get it? Yeah. Huh? I mean, I look out at these faces and I don't know if you're there or not. He said, this is not a personal victory for you, right? Do I have to finish the phrase there, but for the grace of God? How many of you, you can raise your hand or not, depending on your courage or lack of it. How many of you have ever done anything that would have landed you in the who's gal had you been caught? <laughs> Some of you act as if you're proud of it. Every single one of us, if not physically, mentally. Right? Okay. We're open to questions or comments. But let's do, be very slow, very relaxed. Maybe because we suspect that we don't have to race to a solution, but racing to the solution is racing away from the solution. So you're very quiet. And in that state, do you need to ask for any solutions at all? Isn't it a frantic mind, an insane mind, that is chasing around for solutions to its problems, to its tensions, and never, never, never comes to rest? There is nothing bad 
about having a quiet mind. Apparently, you think so, because you resist it so fiercely. You're in love with the noise of the vibrations of your own thoughts and feelings. They're such good friends to have around, so you'll have some direction in life so you'll know what to do with yourself. You stay home and suffer. And then suffer some more, then suffer some more, then suffer some more. Until you want to die. And at that moment that you want to die, you remember what you've learned here. Then the wrong part of you will die. And the right part will be res resurrected. It's there, waiting to be resurrected. Death first. Death first. Otherwise you have false life. Real life comes after the crucifixion of your old nature. That's the order. <coughs> no other procedure will work. And you'll never kid yourself that this nervous, hostile, hateful life that you've been, quote mark, enjoying so much, you'll never convince yourself that it's valid. You'll never convince yourself that it's going to lead you anywhere. And the pain of trying to convince yourself is hell. I repeat, try to see what it means to lose everything. All your friends, all, uh, especially what I'm going to say next especially your marvelous inner reputation of being a good person. Now, don't you say you don't have that. Don't you dare sit there and tell me that you know how evil you are, how bad you are. You don't at all. You don't. If you knew how bad you were, you wouldn't put up with it anymore. When you see how bad you really are and disdain it in favor of something you don't know what, you merely replace one phony morality with another phony morality. <sighs> to give up is to have eternal life, not time life, which is all you have now. Time life is all you have now. You have nothing more than that. None of you, not a single one of you here, none of you listening to this tape. And if by one chance in a billion you were an exception, you would know you're an exception. But the rest of you will imagine you're the exception. You're so weak and cowardly. You won't live from yourself at all. You don't dare live from yourself. It's too foreign to you, too unreal to you. The stage role is so glued on with the mask and the costume and the prepared lines, the memorized lines. You wouldn't know what to do if you walked out that stage door and had to be out in the real world. You've got an audience. No matter whether you play a villain or a hero, at least you've got an audience. Both in here, you're your own audience, and the woman you're married to, or the man you're married to, or the rest of your family, or your friends, and all the other people who are playing on the same stage with you. What would you think of an actor, I mean a real actor on a stage now, and he's in one of these hit plays, Life with Father, or this, some of these plays that go on for years and years, he plays the role over and over and over every night for months and for years. And after the 5,000 performance, 
right in the middle of it he gets so tired of the performance right in the middle of it he walks off stage de defying what the other actors think what the audience thinks and that's simply an illustration when are you going to defy what everyone thinks including all these these hoaxers inside of you that are ready to accuse you when you say I'm tired of the same old lines I'm tired of pretending that we're friends here on the stage because I know we're not friends I know it's all an act and I refuse to play another night's performance I'm going to walk out don't ask me what's going to happen to me because I just don't know I don't know if I know then I'll go out of that theater out to the side entrance into the alley and I'll walk out to the front sidewalk turn left walk a block turn left go into another alley go into the next stage door entrance of that new theater and walk onto the other stage when you walk out of that theater you had better not know what's going to happen to you out there on that sidewalk you had better not have directions you had better not know who's going to help you you had better not be
you're in a conspiracy with your own false parts inside of you and with all your friends and relatives to either play the same role or if you're tired of that to simply switch the role you feel safe as long as you have the lines to say the angers to emit the phony enthusiasms come on now think of all the false enthusiasms you have you're so excited over what you're going to do what you're going to get what you're going to recover what you're going to say what you're going to feel what you're going to drink what you're going to eat what you're going to watch you're so excited over that sometime you catch yourself right in the process of giving yourself an exciting something exciting to do you watch yourself right in the middle of that process and at that second that very split second you walk off the stage and you walk out the side door and you go out to that sidewalk and don't go down to the next theater and you know what's going to happen to you I'll tell you what's going to happen to you when you slip out of that theater and refuse to play the role anymore you're going to go out to that sidewalk and look around for other people and there's not going to be anyone there there's not going to be a woman that you can have sex with men there's not going to be a man that you can lean on and hope that he'll earn the living so you can quit your job down at that dull office there's not going to be someone parading around as a man of God to give tell you lies when you go they leave that theater you had better walk out where there's not going to be anyone out there at all no one to talk to no one to cry to and the reason you must not meet anyone out there is because if you did you would immediately take him or her as the new audience when you go out there and you walk far enough down that street where there's no one there you're forced to see something that you don't want to see you're forced to see that you had this uniform on you're forced to see that you have your lines ready to speak you're forced to see how much you want apl applause and if you can't get applause maybe you can be a criminal and get at least hatred and scorn anything as long as you get a response from someone else when you go out there and don't have anyone to react to who you are or what you're doing you are forced to look inwardly and see why on earth am I doing this and when you begin to look inside yourself then you'll notice the uniform with a badge on you'll notice your beautiful dress that you ladies are wearing that it's just your type of costume and you're forced to examine the costume yourself because you're not distracted by wanting praise or condemnation from the audience you're not looking out there anymore you're looking inwardly and you're beginning to see what a fake what a phony you are and then of course of course for many years after that you'll make a dramatic scene out of that and you'll go around being a sinner maybe or you'll go around being a spiritual student maybe until it gets through your or my thick head that the performance is still going on all by myself now now you stay home and you don't go out like you used to so you just sit home and run the scenes through your own mind you make it just as hard on yourself as you can just as painful as you can you be just you're not you, you, you don't know what it means to be lonely you don't know what it means to be lonely you've got too many distractions too many friends too many songs false songs going through your mind too many activities you say you're lonely only when the distraction happens to dip for a minute and it's not strong enough to occupy your mind then you say I feel so lonely you're lonely all the time you're lonely when you think you're not lonely you had better get totally lonely totally alone all by yourself on the street no cop no cop to ask what direction should I go in how do I get back to the theater you had better lose your directions back to the theater too because you'll want to go back there 
you'll find your feet turning back there and you'd better pray to God that you won't find that alley again that'll put you back on that stage. You had better get lost 10,000 miles out in the desert. Nothing, nothing to help you, nothing to comfort you, no one to talk to so that you want to die. Thank God you've come to that state where you want to give up. Now I'm going to tell you something. When you, when you left that theater right in the middle of that performance, daring to defy the audience, daring to defy the other actors in the stage manner, and daring, daring to not get your paycheck the next day, when you walked out of that theater and you went to the alley and you went to the front sidewalk and you wandered down to the lonely street, nothing out there, nothing out there. I'm going to tell you something you don't know yet, you don't understand yet. It's going to make you happy if you begin to understand. It's going to thrill you like nothing in this world could ever thrill you. <coughs> we know it. Now you're beginning to see it. Now you see that you don't have a have to connection with that sort of thing. You don't have to live that way in thrills. You don't care whether you have two cents or two million dollars. It doesn't it doesn't make any difference to you anymore. Give me two cents or give me I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. That's because you've owned the whole universe. What's two cents or two million dollars compared to owning the whole universe, which is finding your own soul? Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. All right, you're on for questions and comments if you have them. Uh, Joe, where's Joe? Joe, rules, please. Come up front. someone else does it yeah. why should you feel uncomfortable you tell me why you should feel uncomfortable you does it seem strange to yeah, you strange. all right what part of you does that feel strange to part of you that doesn't want to work why does it feel strange to a part of you find out go ahead Len. when Sally spoke a few moments ago I've got two feelings coursing through me, which simply tells me I've got a lot more deep digging to do within myself. Correct. Sally. I saw, when I made the first statement, I saw some of the expressions on some of the people's faces and thought it was serious. Yeah. which shows how easily you can go into fear. Do you mean to tell me that you're going to depend on me all the time? You still want a god? You still want a hero? Go ahead, Tom. Every, every time we take some initiative, we're always met by, we're always met halfway by something higher. That is good. something that I've come across. I, I, I know it for myself now. It every time we try, we're met. And there are no exceptions in that right nice. Away, it's, it, it's, it always happens. That is right. We're 
no hurry, are we? Just a minute. How many of you are ashamed of yourself? That's their nature. I'd sure uh, dislike having to live your life, you bums, who are bums in this room. I wouldn't want to have to suffer like you do. I wouldn't want to suffer from being such a hypocrite, such a liar, such a vicious animal. I wouldn't want to have to pay the price in pain that you have to pay. The pain is dreadful. I'm telling you that you don't have to live in this kind of pain. But to do this, you have to see that you're a big bum, a liar, vicious. I can't think of, I can't think of words bad enough for some of you. I'll go home and study the dictionary. Maybe I can think of some. So at least what I've said in the last two or three minutes We'll get rid of some of you crumbs and you won't come back again. That'll leave a chair for someone who has an ounce of decency who wants to learn. So you go out and you have the answers. Okay? You live with your answers. You live with your answers. But if you ever get tired of being a liar, an animal, Come on back, and you'll get the same thing again, only worse. Then if you can bear it, then there's a dim chance for you. But if you go out and don't come back, then you'll get harder and harder, and scareder and scareder, and more vicious, living in terror of the future and of the present. You're on. What's the place of efforts and aims? I mean, Pardon? What, what's the purpose of efforts and aims? I mean, someone can say, well, I just want to be, go with the flow. No, there's no need to make an effort in that. You know? Well, there's no need to make an effort to, to go with the flow of rushing down into the, the pit. That's your momentum. That's your life. You don't have to make an effort. You have to make an effort to go against the, mo the descending momentum. And that effort can only be made when the urging comes by you looking and seeing where you're going. When you really see that you're going downhill, that, that's the, put it in the same way again, that's your prayer that you want something else than going down in that jungle, sliding down into that jungle deeper and deeper. Only a realization of your present position will give you an urging to get out of it. If you don't have that realization because you're a phony, it's up to you. Yes, Linda. I remember years ago you used to say that uh, those of you who go away will die like dogs and have a very bad reaction to it. And now I know it's true. I, I know it's true what you're saying. It will become more hard and more bitter. You know that from yourself, don't you? Yes. Yeah. I can tell by the way you're saying that at least a part of you understands that. That if you go away from the truth in these classes, and you're, I doubt it very much that you ever you know any other place where you're going to hear the truth. If you go away from this class, you just cut yourself off from the one chance you have of finding out who you really are 
what you find out by finding out who you are not. We're trying to find out who we're not here. That revelation will then reveal who we are, which needs no labels and no identifications and no words to it at all. Your one chance is to come back here and be insulted, be told what a phony you are. And you're ten, you're ten times the phony that you think you are. Who, uh, Larry? I can see quite clearly that the strength I thought I had before I came to these classes was false. And then anything in working in this work that I do is a different kind of strength, totally different. You may make comments if you prefer, or ask a question, either one. Don't waste your time, any of you, please, in asking wrong questions, because you want to avoid the one question, which is, why am I in the state I am in? What's it all about? All right, go ahead, uh, Frank, I guess. Yes, yeah, so I was trying to have something together. If I isolate myself or if I let myself go out into the field, it does no good until I just see the way I am and get some real honest value. And then I'll do the right thing automatically from that value. All right. Okay. Bye. Isn't it? How much? How much longer you got to live? What's your age? What's the average life of the average human being? How much? How much longer you got to live? You may die tomorrow. I may die tomorrow. I want to find eternity while I'm still alive. Or are you satisfied with your time life that we spoke about earlier? All right, all right, you people who know the answers. All right, you people who know better. When are you going to crack up? Tonight sometime? When are you going to crack up in furious anger? When are you going to crack up in depression? When are you going to crack up when you're all alone, throw yourself down on your bed in despair over the hell of your life? You wise guy, you know the answer. You, you told me you knew the answer, and you're cracking up. You're crying. You're bawling. You told me you knew the answer. You, you told me you know more than the truth you're hearing in this class. You know more than me. Yeah, sure. I don't get it. You know the answer, but you're cracking up. Isn't there a contradiction or something? See how hard, enormously hard it is for us to stop telling lies. Do you see how valuable your lies are to you? They're your last refuge to lie. When you don't know what to do, tell a lie. All right. When you tell a lie, that's a sword is split you down the middle. You're two people, you're ten people, you're fifty people. You're not unified, you're not whole. And you don't know which of those 50 people you are. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell all of you people in this room and listen to this tape something. You're not going to get away with it. You have never gotten away with it. You won't get away with it. You won't get away with it in the future. And you sense what I'm talking about. I know you do. Because I know the big, phony, hypocritical, vicious liar in you is listening to what I'm saying. And it is trembling even as I'm talking to you now. Because it knows I'm telling you the truth. You're not going to get away with it. 
aren't you, aren't you grateful to me for speaking to the devil in you that you don't have the courage or the sense to talk to? Aren't you glad that we're here together to work to knock the devil out of every one of us? I know what's going on inside of you. And I know what is necessary for your authentic salvation. And I know if I talk to you this way, it's the one and only chance you've got. I'm giving you that chance tonight. All of you who are new here, old here, all of you. I'm giving you all, every single one of you in this room a chance tonight to find eternity. Having done that, I am through with it. My responsibility has ended. Now it becomes your responsibility to listen and to try for once in your life, just once in your life, to try to be an honest human being about the condition you're occupying, that you're living. And if you go away from this meeting tonight, you go home and you came with someone else and you find yourself defending yourself or attacking the truth you heard here, then I warn you against committing blasphemy. Don't you dare, any one of you, I don't care who you are, don't you go out of this room and sneer at what you've heard here tonight. God have mercy on you if you do. You have sealed your doom. And I know that. And you sense that what I'm telling you is true. And I'm telling you this to give you a chance to catch yourself rejecting and sneering at the truth you've heard here tonight and to watch yourself doing it and begin to wonder about it. And even begin to wonder that you were told that it would happen on the way home and say, how did he know that? Maybe he knows something else, too. Maybe there is one other human being who has one ounce of brains more than I do. I know I'm brilliant and marvelous and have all the answers, but just maybe there's someone who knows a little bit more than I do. As strange as it sounds, there might be an intelligence higher than my own. I'll come back next week and investigate. You know something? If you really want the truth, if you really love it more than you love anything else, the worst storm in the state wouldn't keep you from coming here. 10,000 miles distant wouldn't keep, you, wouldn't keep you from coming here. If your heart is in this class, you'll come back all the time. So it depends on where your heart is, if it's in making money, in keeping your sick, phony friends, and wanting praise is wanting compliment. If your heart is in defending your sickness, defending your egotism, then live with that. Live with that until you get ready to jump off the bridge, either physically or internally. Then maybe you'll remember that and come back here. And what a shame. What a shame you have wasted a year. You've wasted two years. We have about six minutes left. say that when I'm talking to somebody, I usually don't uh, look at them when I'm talking to them. And so I realize this, and I make an effort to look at a person going against this. Yes. It increases the uncomfortable. That's right. That's so right. Then what, and I want to know what to do next. Just stand and shake. <laughs> stand and be twice as nervous. And best of all, if you're lucky, they will notice how nervous you are. And they will lose confidence in Calm Richard. <laughs> and that's your game. You understood that, didn't you, Richard?
I want you to come to every single meeting. And that's not a request, that's an order. Yes, Tom. Uh, dumb trips seem to be on the agenda a lot. Say that again. I say dumb trips seem to be a thing that take, it takes people out of their place. To... Oh, yes. Dumb trips all the time. Before I left home, I was told by my family that I was coming on a dumb trip. What was that? Before I left home, I was told by my family that I was coming on a dumb trip. They don't want you to come up here. You know what they like you to be? What you've always been, always what you have been. Your mental health is a threat to their sickness. They want you to be as sick as they are. That's your parents, that's your children, that's your friends, that's your relatives, that's your minister, that's your religious friends, that's your Christians. Go ahead and laugh it off. You just go ahead and laugh it off. And you watch while you're laughing it off your inner state. Why did you have to laugh it off? Why did you have to spend energy and time in laughing it off? Hmm? If you were sure of yourself, you wouldn't laugh it off. You would know, but you don't know. You're not sure of yourself. And so you attempt to convince yourself by laughing it off. It'll never, never work. From experience, there is no one inside or out who wants us to come here. Right. Darkness has a fierce hatred of the light. I can see that all of my friends, and what I used to think were close friends, especially those who know I'm in these classes, are crouching and waiting for the first sign of frank weakness to put the attack on. I found this out. Isn't that evil, though? Isn't that, see how evil human beings are? You make, you make a, even the smallest sincere effort to break out of the lunatic asylum and all the nuts in there just waiting for some kind of, while you're stumbling on your way out. What do you care whether you stumble on the way out or not as long as you get out? In fact, that's the only way we do get out, right? We stumble every step from the lunatic asylum out into the open field. What do we care how often we stumble? Yes, Tom. You give a talk on the king, the, uh, the prince, and the criminal. And, and, and in the months since that talk took place, that has been a key thing in helping me personally to evaluate my, my actions. When, I, when I'm about to do something, the thought arises and I identify with it, and I'm about to put it into action some evil thing, I look at it and I say, who would do this? The criminal? The prince? You know, the king's eye. I understand. Yes, yeah, right. And I say, who's, who's doing this? The prince or the criminal? And it's, and it's always the criminal ready to do something. We meet here tomorrow morning at 9. Good night.